This is Insight Radio, and you are now listening to your number one online radio station. Online radio station. The light you need on Insight Radio. Six. Radio Ebloom. Nigeria neglected agriculture solely to focus on the health sector. Until date, economists believe that was the genesis of our economic problem. And this is 2024. My opponent has sounded the same alarm of neglect and desertion for us to focus solely on agriculture and making the same mistake again. Ladies and gentlemen, if the faculty of art decide not to learn from history, then we will learn from it. Again, it's the end, not the end of my speech, but definitely the end of the faculty of art. According to an article published by Statista, as of December 2023, Nigerian population was estimated to be about 226.2 million. And a 2023 report by Yu Jong stated that 40% of Nigerians are food insecure. That is, 40% of the population cannot afford access and consume adequate food. Furthermore, Nigerian food insecurity is proposed to be doubled with the current increase in population, according to World Bank, on the 30th September 2020. How can a 63-year-old country deficit in food production and who has not even succeeded in subsistence agriculture, decide to invest in agriculture for world creation when the citizens are hungry. What an artistic nonsense. What an artistic nonsense. Nigeria needs to make agriculture subsistence before making it commercial. Only countries that are well fed, just like New Zealand, decide to invest in agriculture for world creation. Moving on. According to an article published by the Central Bank of Nigeria, on the Central Bank of Nigeria partnership with Green Revolution in Africa. Nigeria agricultural sector has been underperforming since 2004, despite series of government intervention. Yes, it is easily said that this occurred because the government's investment in it is poor. However, the fastest growing sector in Nigeria, according to Naira Matrix in 2022, are trade, finances, insurance, and some industries in the service sectors. And these sectors have grown despite lack of government intervention. If these sectors have grown this far, despite lack of government intervention, you can imagine the growth if the government attention is evenly spread out. Furthermore, according to an article published by Academic Journal on land degradability and sustainability in 2015, Nigerian soil has suffered low fertility due to the bedrock component, erosion, soil physical and chemical degradation, and the main base of, the ag of agriculture is the soil. But if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Dear audience, don't get me wrong. The faculty of veterinary medicine accept that no nation or country can survive without agriculture. But gambling only on agriculture as the solution to creating a lasting world is nothing but a ticking time bomb. A word is enough for the wise. In fact, a speech is enough for the wise, but not the faculty of art. If my opponents come here thinking Ewa, Gary, uh, 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 is the solution to creating a lasting world, then wait for another round of lectures from my second speaker. From the noble faculty of veterinary medicine, I am Akiola Akinjide. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother Upmost. Thank you so much. Brethren in the Lord, that was a wonderful ministration by our very dear brother. Please celebrate Jesus, celebrate Jesus. Put your hands together, put your hands together. Thank you so much. Now we'll be listening to the very next minister as they'll be ministrating and giving us a very, very sound, loud, and amazing speech. With a resounding applause, let us make welcome from one of our parishes, the Faculty of Arts, put your hands together for a sister in the Lord, Muhabbat Salauddin.
Today, history will smile upon me for saying its story about southwestern Nigeria, road on the loamy soils of Madiwo, Agoiwoye, Ajegule, among other farm settlements, to create not just economic freedom, but to free the coming generations from economic doom. Audience, the late chief of Bafem Yahulawa noted in his speech on the appropriation bill on the 7th of April 1960 that between 1955 and 1956, the gross national income was 806.8 .8 million pounds, of which 504.1 million pounds was derived from agriculture, livestock, and fishery. So, as at then, the base of Nigeria's wealth was agriculture. Following the discovery of crude oil, Nigeria went on from being one of the few African countries with a very strong and stable economy, low poverty rates, with an employment rate of 70% to a country with a depleting economy, increasing food import by 700% and with an army of over 200 million unemployed citizens, according to the International Journal of Developing Societies, in their article titled From Agriculture to Our Production. So you see, in simple mathematics, when agriculture was at the forefront of our economy, our wealth was booming. When agriculture left the forefront, our wealth took a nosedive. This only goes to show that it is not just a solution, but the solution. Intelligent audience, times may have changed, but the impact of agriculture on our present economy cannot be overestimated. I mean, even with less government allocation, agriculture still surpass other sectors that receive higher budgets. For instance, in 2023, the government allocated, just hold on, 1.05% of the national budget to agriculture, and agriculture generated over 20% of the national GDP, while crude oil generated just 5.48% in the same year. So you see that agriculture is still working miracles despite limited resources. Audience, my opponents will be a fundamental error in today's debate. They argue that agriculture is not sufficient and it cannot meet the growing needs of Nigeria. However, according to the World Bank in their article titled Agriculture and Food, they said that growth in agriculture is two to four times more effective in increasing income compared to other sectors. And that is because agriculture can easily maneuver its way to other sectors at like the manufacturing industry and the energy industry for providing wood for paper and power for, for energy. So you see that not only is it sufficient, it is also sustainable. They may also argue that agriculture in Nigeria is done on a small scale. Therefore, it cannot be the solution to just exploitation. You see, due to my opponent's issue at your world, we understand why they may not believe in progress. Because the potential for an expansion is the main reason why agriculture remains the solution to just exploitation. As a matter of fact, funds needed for large-scale farming are already made available by the financial institutions and the bank of industry. And these funds are bound to increase once agriculture becomes the focus for wealth creation. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, today's debate should be shown to whether agriculture is the solution to just wealth creation. Rather, it should be that agriculture has been the solution to just wealth creation. Hence, if after all said and done, my opponent still disagrees, then may history remember this day that salvation came, yet that medicine students refused. From the faculty of arts, my book of Salaudi is my name. You are Maybe because she mentioned salvation in her speech. All right, we'll be moving over to the second speaker from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Jam your hands together for Odwala Mariam. Gentlemen, I am not surprised that the faculty of art is stuck up on agriculture. After all, their department of history still lives in the past. But I, Miriam Odwala, from the faculty of veterinary medicine, will show you that the road to wealth creation does not align with agriculture being the major solution. Dear audience, the year is 2024, but let's go back to 1965. Cocoa the first skyscraper in tropical Africa, was built in 1976. Operation Feed the Nation was launched. These two points were her highest agricultural efforts in history. Nigeria's third agriculture was the measure for a booming economic growth. We were thought agriculture gave us Cocoa House, Obafe Miaolo University, and even the University of Ibadan. For us, that really the reality. Ladies and gentlemen, in these two years, according to CPN Common Digital Records, Nigeria made less 
than 10% of our total revenue through agriculture. What more do we need to learn from me? More like the lessons you're to the faculty all about. My intelligent audience, why do we need to argue? When we can check the top countries, focusing on agriculture as a major source of wealth generation. Ethiopia has the largest GDP share of agriculture, followed by Mali, Comoros, and others. But which of these countries can we emulate? Look at the stories of the great Asian tigers. Their success stories do not even lie on agriculture. Yet, they are one of the best economies on health within a short period of time. So applies to the Americans and the Europeans. We have almost the same resources as these countries. Why then are we testing grants again? Why we can follow the lay down path to success? Recall, Nigeria has 84 million acres of arable land and about 40 million farming families. But when has that been the solution to our wealth creation? In 2022, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, only 24% of our total GDP contribution came from agriculture, which is less when compared to 44.04% that came from the service sector and 30.78% that came from the industrial sector. In 2004, Lagos State Government was the non-local government allocation by the then President General Olusegun Shekun Obasanjo. Then, Lagos State experienced an increase of 104% in literally generated revenue. This is a step with no cultural resources. Why does Nigeria think our culture is the solution to our wealth creation? Today, according to Statista, Lagos State is one of the fourth richest city in Africa, generating more wealth than agricultural centers take. So, what are we discussing, ladies and gentlemen? What is wealth creation? We don't consider when the country is in trouble. Now, imagine Nigeria relied on agriculture for total revenue in 2020, when all agricultural activities were put on a hold due to restricted movement. Only from the faculty of that. This is not about English. It's about the science of running higher animal affairs. A country has to maximize its total resources for the utmost satisfaction of its citizens and necessities. Why then should Nigeria think the solution to our wealth creation is agriculture? But well, there are several other means. It's a state of misplaced priority or a state of faculty of that. Are more European courses than indigenous courses? I have said a lot, but it's time to learn, or learn and relearn, and not feel on bad approaches. We will not feel on logic and flood this. We need facts and a working model. And with all of this, agriculture is not a major solution to our wealth in Nigeria. Maybe our brothers and sisters from the faculty of that focus on your philosophy and leave the real life which is what that did to make things. We don't feel like logic and flawed history. Thank you. Take it outside. Let's go, let's go. If you, if you are from the faculty of veterinary medicine or from the faculty of art, make some noise. Let's go, let's go, let's go. DJ, take it down, take it down, take it down, take it down. Now we are going to the very next round of debate, and this round is between a very, very important faculty, the Faculty of Environmental Design and Management. I thought we all agreed that whether you are from environmental design or not, everybody will shout. Are we ready? Let's do that again. Faculty of Environmental Design and Management! That's more like it. Against the Faculty of Basic Medical Science. They will be speaking on the topic Private sector dominance, a viable solution to healthcare delivery in Nigeria. That's the topic they'll be speaking on. And we have the first speaker who will be from the Faculty of what? Faculty of Environmental Design and Management. A resounding applause for Akindele Ayomiko testimony. Another one.
am today. I arrived at Jaja. Five hours later, I left as I seemed to be getting no as I seemed to be getting no closer to seeing the doctor. Fifteen, fifteen minutes later, I let us start again. Seven a.m. today, I arrived at Jaja. Five hours later, I left as I seemed to be getting no closer to seeing the doctor. I headed outside school. I walked the short distance to Omak Pharmaceuticals. Fifteen minutes later, I am living with my prescription medicine and an instruction to come back three days later if my symptoms persist. Esteemed audience, first, allow me to establish the fact that today's jaw war topic is not hinting on the war between the public and the private sector. It only asks the question if private sector dominance is a viable solution to healthcare in Africa. Judges, viable solution. According to the college dictionary, a solution that is said to be viable is said to be practical, useful, and has the capacity of being a success. It is not new news that solutions exist to solve problems. In this same vein, ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully, pay close attention. In five minutes, let me show you how the problems that the private sector provide are viable. The first problem, the shortage of healthcare workers. Intelligent audience. It's been 23 years since our very own Nigerian government promised to increase the budget allocation or to healthcare from 5% to 15%. You would agree with me that this is more than enough time to carry out whatever reform it was that they wanted to carry out. Every week, a minimum of 50 doctors leave Nigeria to work abroad due to the weak and underfunded public systems, according to the Nigerian Medical Association. According to the Nigerian Medical Association, now, imagine how bright the future of the Nigerian, the future of the Nigerian healthcare system would be if these 59,800 doc, if these 59,800 doctors, if these 59,800 doctors remain in Nigeria and set up their own private medical institutions. 23 years later, the healthcare system of Nigeria and Africa at large will be seen to have improved greatly. How? How? Says law says that supply creates its own demand. That is to say, if there is enough supply of a good or service, if, if there is enough supply of a good or service, there will also be enough demand. And this will lead to the reduction of price. Ladies and gentlemen, a solution that is a win-win is a viable solution. The next problem, limited access to healthcare services. According to the Legal Information Institute, healthcare service can be defined as any service rendered by a healthcare professional or by anyone under the supervision of the healthcare professional. When there is an increase in the number of healthcare providers, there will be unlimited access to healthcare services. Unlike South Africa, a lot of African countries cannot boast of high standard of healthcare, not to talk of the best standard of healthcare. Several, deba several debates up to this point have shown that a lot of African countries cannot even set up, cannot set up health, health care centers across their own communities. The private sector, the private sector fills this gap. If more African countries engage in public-private partnerships, the healthcare sector of the, the healthcare sector of the continent will improve, and this will lead to increase in access to healthcare services. And this is a viable solution. The last problem, dear audience, is the inadequate health infrastructure and services. As aspiring healthcare providers, my opponents are very familiar with the demolished health infrastructure of a lot of African countries. It is the reason why they will pick to. It is the reason why they will pick to be carried out at Afebawalo Teaching Hospital and the UCH that trained them. That the UCH that trained them, according to the World Bank, about half of Africa's health infrastructure and resources are provided for by the by the health private health sector. When COVID struck in 2019, the public health care of a lot of African countries were already in the mud. Countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, Nigeria, and even Kenya were built up by the public sector. Were built up by the public sector. It is even quite unfortunate that my opponents are even at the opposing side of this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I want to tender an apology on behalf of my opponents. When they come up, do not be too disappointed in their basic arguments. Simply allow them to display. Now, let the show begin. Super. Ready? Ready, Duke. Thank you, DJ Upmost. 
Now we're moving over to the first speaker from the Faculty of Basic Medical Sciences. With a loud applause. Thank you. Let's make welcome Amuso Abigail. person sitting in your room, they will save two. So please stay calm. Only two out of ten persons will be saved. It's fine. We are all fine. Esteemed audience, this, according to research by Oxfam International, is the reality of my opponent's proposition. More precisely, according to the paper titled Blind Optimism, published in February 2009, only two out of ten people in sub-Saharan African countries can afford private healthcare services. Investopedia defines the private sector as the part of the economy run by individuals and companies for profit and is not state controlled. The Merriam Webster Dictionary defines the term viable as capable of working, functioning, or developing adequately. Clearly, the distance of my opponent's faculty from the rest of the school has caused them to lose touch with reality. So I stand here today as a scientist with facts and figures, and I will prove that their design is faulty from the foundation and cannot be managed. First, an article by the World Health Organization on the 30th of September 2022, titled The Role of the Government in Supporting Health, states that it is the role of the government to support health and well-being, as well as provide good quality health care, which is affordable and accessible to all who need them. This is the foundation of our global health care system, and a deviation from it will be a deviation from our environmental design. Yet, my opponents claim that the private sector should be in charge because the government may not be able to provide adequate health care. Don't be surprised if they also argue that the private sector should take over the fight against insurgency because the military may not be able to guarantee our safety. Dear audience, a scientist has said it. The WHO confirms it. Who then are my opponents to reject it? Second, according to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, SDG 3.8, all member countries aim to achieve universal health coverage, which according to the WHO means that all people have access to good quality health care services when and where they need them without financial hardship. A system controlled by private sector organizations will not work or align with this plan as only those who can afford proper health care will have it available to them. The International Journal of Pharmaceutical Health highlights in 2021 that the price difference between private and public sector medicine was as high as 395.47%. In context, ladies and gentlemen, if GD decides to do marathon TDB and breaks down with malaria, rather than the regular 1,200 Naira, GD might have to spend up to 4,000 Naira on anti-malaria, thanks to my opponent. Ladies and gentlemen, a solution that solves the problem for only a few is in no way a viable solution. This is a core truth, not even in environmental design. But I guess my opponents miss those classes to write their journal speeches. So we see, ladies and gentlemen, a scientist has said it. The International Journal of Pharmaceutical Healthcare confirms it. Who then are my opponents to reject it? Moving on, judges. My opponents will argue that private sector dominance will improve the productivity and quality of healthcare due to high money influx. However, I put it to you that contrary to what they will have us believe, private sector dominance does not, do not, and cannot ultimately guarantee an improved healthcare system. To put this in context, according to the Commonwealth Fund, the United States has one of the most expensive healthcare systems among other industrialized countries, yet they run poorly in efficiency and quality compared to these other countries. In terms that my opponents understand, spending a lot of money on fame that come up with Casablanca is not directly proportional to having a quality and fun event. Because your people know good stuff, they will still always show up for Ibiza. 
ladies and gentlemen, a scientist has said it. The Commonwealth Fund confirms it. Who then are my opponents to reject it? Finally, ladies and gentlemen, as my opponents will duly point out, the African healthcare system does need help. However, private sector dominance does not directly address any of our problems. According to the International Journal of General Medicine, in 2019, the primary challenge of healthcare system in Africa is inadequate human resources, followed by inadequate budgetary allocations. If these problems can be duly addressed, African countries can turn towards having improved healthcare delivery. A good example is South Africa, which ranked as the highest healthcare index in Africa between 2019 and 2023, according to Statistia. And this was not achieved by private sector dominance. As the same start proves that only 16% of their 61 million population actually uses private sector providers. Ladies and gentlemen, a scientist has said it. The International Journal of General Medicine confirms it. Who are my opponents to reject it? Moving on, ladies and gentlemen. In conclusion, as the African proverb said, cutting off the head is not the remedy for a headache. Private sector dominance will not only fail to address our problems, but will even cause complex problems such as social stratification and service fragmentation. Once again, a scientist has said it. Even our forefathers confirmed this. Who then are my opponents to reject it? Ladies and gentlemen, if my opponents still come here today to try to convince you otherwise, you know what to do. This year, no grief for anybody. From the top of your face, I am a Sounding the dust to the last speaker. Please, please. Gentlemen, welcome. It is the year 2050, and the private sector has eventually dominated the healthcare delivery system in Africa. It was achieved through all your struggle between the private and the public sector. Her same charges. According to the Merriam Webster dictionary, the, the word dominance means superiority to all others in influence and importance, which means the private sector dominated simply because it had more to offer. Ladies and gentlemen, follow me closely through the story of Mr. Tamayi. Mr. Tamayi, a Zimbabwean, is a middle class citizen. He attempted to the Zimbabwe government for increasing the minimum wage to 150 US dollars. Compared to the previous years, Mr. Tamayi now has more to spend, but we still have to spend a lot to get quality health care in this country. Due to to get quality health care in this country. Because like most of other African countries, the public health care sector is weak and underfunded. According to a report published by Aetna, titled Healthcare Quality in Africa, Zimbabwe is ranked 155 out of 199 in the world. According to WHO, a ratio of one doctor to 10,000 patients. Esteemed judges, take a deep breath and say the truth for yourself. Because my opponents, in, a, in an attempt to display their basic understanding of the topic, has refused to see the truth. It is the year 2050. The private sector has eventually dominated the healthcare delivery system. Mr. Tamayi now has access to quality healthcare. If Mr. Tamayi now has access to quality healthcare, thanks to the dominance of private healthcare sector, he can now he now has access to provide for the basic need. Mm -hmm. Mr. Tamayi now has access to basic quality health care. He can now afford quality service with state-of-the-art infrastructure and divert the excess fund to provide for the basic need of life, such as clothing, food, which are basic determinants of health, double victory, all thanks to the dominance of the private sector. Mr. Tamayi now has access to affordable and quality health care service. 
you no longer has to worry about the high cost, about the high cost of the of the private of the public health care system that has no quality service. My opponents may come here to say that the dominance of the private sector will make health care less affordable and accessible to Africans as a whole. But they miss the mark on the surface. It may seem that private sector getting stronger means that health care costs will climb to the roof. But it is not so. Not we have more people competing for the same service. It will follow the principle of demand and supply. Real market price will be forced to fall to increase market reach, ultimately influencing the supply side of healthcare. This will incentivize providers to innovate and expand their service by offering a variety of options to meet varying patients' needs. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we lay the truth before you. Accept it and it shall set you free. <laughs> Did your post? All right, to be calling on the second speaker from the Faculty of Basic Medical Sciences, jam your hands together for Lawal Idayat. point. These designers have successfully achieved two things. One, grossly exaggerating the benefit of a private healthcare system. And two, deflecting from the foundations of these arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Basic Medical Sciences Diagnostic Center. Before anyone overdoses on my opponent's presumed prison pill who run this drug through a basic clinical trial. Dear audience, I recommend that you stay attentive and buckle in with your nose mask so the full set of my opponent's absurd argument does not corrupt your senses as you rouse them. <laughs> test 1, the accessibility test. According to an article published by Oxford University Press on private healthcare in Nigeria, private hospitals and distribution of retail pharmacies show that in Oyo, Ogo and Lagos, more than 80% of private health facilities are located in urban or wealthy areas. The United Nations also stated in 2018 that less than 43% of Africans live in cities. Therefore, my opponent will be condemning more than 57% of Africans to poor health care due to their postal code. Simply put, in every village, a pregnant woman in labor may have to wait on the woman others to help out while praying to a murderer for safety just because the closest private health care is hours away. Test one failed. Test two, the regulation test. Most high-income countries have effective regulatory system built up over decades that control the private sector. If the government is committed to doing so, then we can be rest assured that the private sector will operate in the manner consistent with human rights norms. However, according to the book Privatization in the Age of Globalization, by Cole Defita, enforcement of regulation in many low- and middle-income countries, especially in Africa, is weak. Thus, the states where public provision of healthcare has failed are just least able to oversee that the private sector do well. Therefore, judges, the obvious answer to the important question of whether private sector dominance is capable of working adequately in Africa is no. This is like painting a building with cracked walls and shaky foundations just to make it look beautiful. Ah, uh -huh. designers, you should know better. Test two failed. Test three, the feasibility test. My opponent may have come to say that the economic private sector dominance is necessary to shift the cost from the government and to fix our economic issues. And they may even have come to side countries where this has been successful. But let them know that the economic realities of most African countries are incompatible with this solution. For example, in 2006, Netherlands transferred the sickness fund system to a regulated market structure where most individuals are responsible for significantly larger part of the insurance cost. This worked for them because according to Transparency International, the Netherlands ranks eighth in the least corrupt countries in the world. In the least corrupt country of in the least corrupt country in the world, in a continent as corrupt as Africa, my opponent suggests.
question. We don't need to mismanagement of more, of more fun. Test three failed. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we have seen that my opponent's arguments have failed the clinical exam. Yes, it has failed the efficiency, the feasibility, and the accessibility test. It should be avoided and discarded. While my opponent think they came to this debate with the perfect blueprint to win. All they've done is construct bad dreams from the faculty of basic medical sciences. I'm liar, a diet, a beard. Can you please put your hands together for all the speakers in that round? Put your hands together. Now the next round we are going to, there are supposed to be alleged political brothers, these faculties. Faculty of Public Health versus Faculty of Dentistry. Please put your hands together for both faculties. Is that the best you can do? <laughs> Now, the Faculty of Public Health and Faculty of Dentistry, they will be speaking on the... T See, if you are a finalist in the hall, you are a finalist and you can hear me, and you can listen to the sound of my voice well, loud and clear, you need to listen to this debate. Do you know why? Because the topic is, is the NYSE program still relevant in modern Nigeria? Wait, 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 wait. Why are freshers making noise? What happened? Wait, wait, up close. Up close. All things being equal, you still have like eight years to go, Abby. You just they play. Now, the first speaker would be the speaker from public health. Put your hands together, put your hands together. As I make welcome, the one, the only, the man, the mate, the legend, Adjushe Ije. Esteemed audience, welcome to today's class. And our main objective is to determine if the NYC scheme is still relevant in modern Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, soon you realize that despite the peculiarities of present day Nigeria, which includes inflation and insecurity, the 51 year old program is still relevant. And according to the Merriam Webster Dictionary, relevant means having significant and demonstrable bearing on the matter at hand. Audience, today's topic or idea agrees that the NYC scheme was relevant at some point, as the necessity for the world to steal, which can be explained as continues to have importance despite all circumstances. So judges, we know, the government knows, but my parents do not know, and we expect them to take notes in their notes that despite the challenges being faced by the NYC in today's Nigeria, and that patients have been made to ensure that the scheme continues to fulfill objectives. So their opponents, please take notes, as I deliver just four notes, detailing why the NYC scheme remains useful, despite numerous challenges. Note one, national unity. Audience, Nigeria has over 250 ethnic groups, and that is why one of the core objectives of the NYC Act is the promotion of national unity and integration by posting graduates of tertiary institutions to different states in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, the aftermath of last year's general elections was more ethnic tensions, even on social media. You see tribes against one another. So you see that the NYC is our same unity in diversity and as evidence in the 2018 study titled NYC program and the quest for national integration by Professor Aramufa, the NYC promotes entitling marriages among the youth, thereby resulting in greater integration and therefore reducing prejudice. 
others, my parents will undermine the NYC's relevance by arguing that Nigeria has failed to achieve national unity. But judges, according to Objective 5 of the NYC Act, which can be quoted as to develop common ties among the Nigerian youth and to promote national unity and integration, the aim is to promote, not achieve, as the NYC alone cannot achieve national unity. For Nigeria to achieve unity is an operation of every single citizen. Nonetheless, the NYC drives us closer to national unity. Because Solomon from Sokoto gets a first time experience of Arab culture in Anamba by eating our food and speaking our language. So you see that why the dentists are busy curing toothaches, NYC is curing the eggs of prejudice and filling the cavities of the city. No true skill acquisition. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, 53.4% of Nigerian youth were unemployed in 2022. Little wonder why the youth are encouraged to learn income skills. Judges, the NYC understood the assignment and established the skill acquisition and interpretation department in 2012, which facilitated the training of 200,000 graduates annually for self reliance according to NYC.gov.ng. Use a method of lucrative fields like agriculture and information technology, and that is still not all. In an article by the Pronoun Times in 2023, the NYC trained our going core members on employability skills, such as critical thinking and resume building. Therefore, assisting the youth to become more employed. Even the U.S. Student Union, led by OST, a dentistry student, understood the importance of skill acquisition, and therefore, OST led the right to a three-day peace camp. Audience, my opinion may mention the death of common members due to insecurity. Judges, we know that human lives are irreplaceable, and we sympathize with common members that have died. However, the NYC is just a victim of the problem, which is insecurity. Because innocent farmers and harmless villagers are also killed. Nonetheless, the protection of every Nigerian citizen is an obligation of the government. And President Bola Tinubu, in his inauguration speech, promised himself for insecurity. Also, according to NYCCDS.com, top members' policies to volatile states can now choose to redeploy for security reasons. No three, economic development. As published by the Vanguard on the 8th of May 2023, it shall reveal that no fewer than 400,000 youth participate in the NYT annually, making the scheme a good platform to contribute to the growth of the national economy. In 2022, the NYT director of press, Eddie Megua, stated that core members become professional entrepreneurs during service and are ready to contribute to the GDP of the country. He also said that the NYT trust fund will assist core members with capital for setting up their small scale businesses. Likewise, core members serve as personnel for establishing institutions of economic development, like the general elections, the population census, and immunizations. Note 4 emergency response. In a 2021 interview, the NYC Director General Shuaibi Ibrahim stated that core members make up the reserve of Nigeria's national defense and can be mobilized for war if need be. Similarly, according to an article by the Guardian dated 14 to 2015, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, trained serving core members on party disaster management, just as orientation camps include emergency response training, which enable core members to assist in critical situations. For example, in the aftermath of the flood, trained NYC members can collaborate with local authorities in an affected area to provide emergency relief. In conclusion, I have shown that the NYC has evolved to many over to modern Nigeria. And to my opponents, we know that you cannot win your war. So just redeploy or try again next year. Keep jamming your hands together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bullet says it's us for where he did. Tell your name. Wessa. I can't hear you say the pressure is getting worse. So what about now? I'll be calling on the first speaker from the Faculty of Dentistry. With a loud applause, let's welcome on stage the one, the only, Atimo Mofi. <laughs>
Some tiny cockroaches are just Tunde finds it so hard to sleep all night. Bed bugs no green make him sleep. Even in his kitchen, some tiny cockroaches are just everywhere. Mosquitoes in car always humming nauseating melodies around his ears every night. Right now, he's sick and tired of all this mess. But hasn't he heard of SB Fumigation Services? With SB Fumigation Services, bed bugs, cockroaches, and all pest problems are gone for life. Call SB Fumigation Services today and see the wonders of getting rid of pests in your homes, offices, warehouses, supermarkets, and other places at affordable cost. We are just a phone call away from you on 070-8442-1068. 070-8442-1068. SB Fumigation Services. Sleep without worries. Not the remote past. Today's debate is there for night asking if this thing should be scrapped, nor is it asking if it requires an upgrade or downgrade, even if it is in retrograde. It is simply asking if the current ideologies of the NYSC scheme are appropriate to our current reality in Nigeria. Work with me as I prove this irrelevant to you, using the exact blueprint of establishment, reconcile, reconstruct, and rebuild. Reconcile. According to NYC.gov, the scheme was established to reconcile the tribes at war and address the high level of disunity in the nation. Five decades later, and we are yet to see significant improvement from incessant tribalistic bigotry to religious extremism. Modern Nigeria with her ethno-religious challenges has rendered this scheme useless. In a 2005 survey by the Washington University Center for Social Development, 70% of core members expressed their dissatisfaction inability to reconcile the nation two decades later and we are still questioning this same relevance. Bashiru Salau, a professor of sociology in his paper titled Ethno-Religious Conflicts in Nigeria, stated that ethno-religious intolerance has become much more violent, claiming over 3 million lives and causing unquantifiable damage. Intelligent audience, this completely defeats reconciliation and if it continues to fail, it is only right that it fails to continue. Reconstruct. The NYC was established to reconstruct the very idea of nationalism. A citizen's sense of devotion and the NYC was established to, to, the NYC was established to address the high level of nationalism. A citizen's sense of loyalty and devotion to their nation. According to Aluko Anajani, professor of sociology at the Obafem Yaolo University, the factors responsible for cultural identification over nationalism include one, a lack of patriotism. Two, monopoly of power by major ethnic groups. And three, marginalization of the minority groups. All of which can be solved by good leadership and patriotism, not the NYSC. Intelligent audience, this completely defeats reconstruction. Sadly, my opponents believe that uh, unity can be achieved by marching under the hot sun, climbing ropes and shouting, Koppa we, Koppa wa. How ridiculous. Rebuild. The NYC was established to rebuild every sector of the nation as a united people. Unfortunately, the African Polling Institute reports that the Nigerian Index of Unity currently measures a measly 39.6%. In case you are wondering, this means that for every 10 Nigerians, less than 4 actually want to be associated with each other. Judges, it will be impossible to move forward as a nation if we don't even want to be together intelligent audience. This completely defeats rebuilding. And unlike what my opponents are used to, delusion is not the solution for this nation. The NYSC makes our core members targets of kidnappings in recent times. August 17, 2023, eight fresh graduates in a Sokoto bound bus from Akwa Ibom were kidnapped in Zampara State. Over 100 days later, and neither the government nor the NYC makes significant progress to secure their release. To make matters worse, this same NYC, according to page 56 of their Security Awareness Handbook, explicitly insinuated that they will not be responsible for the security of core members when they travel. Even going as far as encouraging them to pay off whatever ransom is demanded when they are kidnapped. It is unfortunate that this same scheme that was established to prevent insecurity is now a victim of insecurity itself. In a desperate attempt to win today's debate, my opponents might claim that uh, insecurity can be avoided by the redeployment of core members to safer areas. What they fail to understand is that redeployment of core members not only amplifies the corruption within the scheme, 
but also defeats the very essence of the scheme, reconciliation, reconstruction, and rebuilding to achieve cultural integration. So you see, that opinion by my opponents from public health is not palatable enough for public consumption. Finally, even if my opponents were to win today's debate in an alternate universe, it would only be for selfish reasons, as the very NYIT scheme is only open to citizens with specific degrees. According to their official website, only citizens with university degrees and higher national diplomas can participate in the scheme. Other degrees like the Nigerian Certificate of Education, which trains you to become a teacher, are exempted. Adam Ohaya, to a political analyst, when asked, said, in the past, these exemptions were non-existent. However, due to the government's inability to cater for the rising numbers, exclusions had to be made, defeating the very essence of the scheme. This only proves that the game is rigged against the citizens even before they play, with my opponents serving as the referees. In conclusion, I have spent the last five minutes showing you what is in our current reality. Hopefully, affliction will not rise a second time. Spending three minutes of our precious time, preaching relevance with irrelevant points and punchlines. However, in case they do, please endure their well-crafted lines while holding on firmly to the truth. The NYC scheme is not relevant in modern Nigeria. And my name is Sofu Papalola and you are now listening to your number one online radio station. Online radio station. The light you need on Insight Radio. Papa, we, we, we. Okay. <laughs> The second speaker from the Faculty of Public Health. The second speaker from the Faculty of Public Health. If your hands are not too busy, please put them together for Ajeni Feja Tolua Lashe. Cavities, but rather filling the gaps in our societies and empowering graduates with skills. So why do you have still stuck in the cavities of our dated ideas? I implore us to brace up, as I use just three points, to prove the argument wrong. One, in an interview of the Daily Independent News on the 3rd of May 2023, Chief Kenya the community leader of the Foreign Land the State, said that, said that the NYC program now plays a relevant role in contributing to rural development in Nigeria. As the Community Development Service, which is a core scheme in the NYC program, give for coppers to engage in projects, such as the establishment of premium care services in community, he further stated, that the posting of COP members to fill in for the scarcity of teachers in community schools, bridges the educational gap phase in such areas. So, judges, we can now see that the NYC program, through the Community Development Service, portrays the more relevancy of it, as it tends to reduce the burden and even complement the effort of the local government authority in such community, amplify the overall impact of the program to the development of the Nigerian labor force. Moving on to the second point. When my opponent will come to argue that the NYC program is no longer relevant, they will claim it plays no significant role in the power of the country to show baseless arguments and article titled The Evolving of NYC Program in Modern Nigeria, published by the Blueprint Media in 2019 reviewed. That what makes the NYC program still relevant is the role it plays in the power use of the country. As the article further reviewed, that some organizations these government members are posted to serving now tend to employ them after the end of the service, and it even creates room for them to begin fully self-employed through the skills they learned during the course of the program, which further reduces the rate of unemployed due to the streets, ensuring a more secured and guaranteed Nigeria. Lastly, to the third point, in an attempt to prove a point, my brother will come to tell us that 
the NYC program is not cost effective. Really, judges, all they are trying to say is that the cost of running the NYC program should not be seen as a financial burden of the Nigerian government, but not an investment in building a better Nigerian future. Dear opponent, I understand your dental skills might be sharp, but see, it seems the arguments now lack bite. Maybe they should start flossing their thoughts, not their teeth, before they speak. As Mr. Anthony Ali, a former director of the NYC mobilization program, in an interview with Channel Stephen 2019 said, the relevancy of the NYC program can't be undermined, as investing in the program simply means investing in the youth and development of the country at large. In conclusion, in conclusion, as all have said, my opponent will still come to say that the NYC is no longer relevant in Nigeria. We should just let them know that since they refuse to see the relevancy in NYC, then ladies and gentlemen, it is guaranteed you will never see the road to ICC. <laughs> to reiterate the topic. The topic goes thus, is the NYSE program still relevant in modern Nigeria? Calling on the second speaker from the Faculty of Dentistry, jam your hands together for Temidayo Lawrence. Tunde finds it so hard to sleep all night. Bed bugs no green make him sleep. Even in his kitchen, some tiny cockroaches are just everywhere. Mosquitoes in car always humming nauseating melodies around his ears every night. Right now, he's sick and tired of all this. This is relevant to modern Nigeria. This means they are either overestimating the abilities of NYST to solve Nigeria's problems, or they are underestimating the peculiarities of modern Nigeria. Either way, just like the NYC scheme, their points are irrelevant to today's debate. Audience, the NYC is not relevant to modern Nigeria because of career mismatch. The mandatory nature of the program has delayed graduates in the pursuit of their career opportunities as they are compelled to dedicate a substantial amount of time to a service that does not align with their professional goals. A survey by the African Journal of Education in 2022 stated that five out of six core members experience a job mismatch between the degrees they are earned and the duties assigned to them. This is just like teaching a man to fish all his life, only to employ him as a dentist. It does not fulfill logical expectations and is only a recipe for disaster. Judges, the NYC is not relevant to modern Nigeria because it promotes corruption and substandard infrastructure. According to an article titled Scrapping the NYC by Daily Post on 25th May 2021, with 70,000 Naira, you can get redeployed to the two most sought after states, Lagos and Abuja, defeating the very essence of NYC, cultural integration. It also stated that despite the annual allocation of over 100 billion since 2018, the scheme still lacks the infrastructural framework it truly needs due to corrupt activities. Imagine, a program designed to shape our future leaders is not even in shape. My opponent may claim that NYC promotes national unity. However, a paper titled The Role of Culture and Tourism in Promoting National Unity by Augustine Okeke stated that creating a strong relationship between culture and tourism, not NYC, promote national unity. Unfortunately, one of the greatest hindrances to tourism is national insecurity. Simply put, if we tackle national insecurity, it becomes an open door to tourism, jobs, and national unity, defeating the relevance of NYC. So you see, just like a jam score of 199 for a UI aspirant, that point is weak, and we will not accept it. My opponent may claim that NYC promotes patriotism and loyal service to Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, in a 2020 article titled Nigerian Patriotism by Dakuku Peter Said, the major determinants of patriotism include a high level of public trust, good governance, and good leadership, all of which Nigeria lacks. If truly the NYC promotes patriotism, they make it optional and watch how the number of applicants drastically fall like the value of Lera. Even my patriotic opponent would gallantly skip the program. Then we'll see the hypocritical stance in their speeches. Finally, my opponents will be going off point if they say the NYC only needs a modification. Clearly, not the topic of today's debate. And any attempt to revamp, we modify, or reform the NYC 
would only prove its inability to reconcile, reconstruct, and rebuild in this modern Nigeria. Dear opponents, in all debates, let the truth be your aim, not on just interest. Public health, do better. I woke up Chris Breezy. Oh my God, I'm the man. I'm so dry and I can dance. There's turkeys over there. I just can't stop crying. Team Jamie Gang, thank you all for the speakers from Faculty of Public Health and Faculty of Dentistry. Jam your hands together for them. If you are sure that your faculty will win, jam your hands together for your speakers. Yeah, thank you very much. So we are going to the last round for the first category, and it's between the Faculty of the Social Sciences and Faculty of Pharmacy. Yeah, that's a very loud noise. All right, the Faculty of Social Science versus Faculty of Pharmacy will be speaking on the topic, corporations should be legally required to remain politically neutral in all their operations. So I'm calling on the first speaker from the Faculty of the Social Science. Keep making the noise. Keep jamming your hands together as I call on the first speaker. Jam your hands together for your Aya Dokas. into a boardroom at Dangote headquarters, where Aliko Dangote and his fellow shareholders are seated discussing their political stance in the 2027 election. You will agree with me that the question in the room will be, what side do they stand to gain more from? Let's cut the imagination and delve into reality. Profit maximization is what drives cooperation, and all their actions are directed towards this notion. In reference to today's debate, Political is defined by the Merriam Western Dictionary to mean relating to the government or the conduct of government. And in turn, political neutrality is the absence of this. So, ladies and gentlemen, to answer the question on ground and show why corporations must stay politically neutral, let's evaluate the effects of the law on all parties involved. Party A, the citizens. In Australia, about 135 people die daily from cancer as reported by the Australia Institute of Health and Welfare. But these deaths continue to pile up because of the interference of corporations in political decision. This is revealed in a January 2022 article by the Australian Human Rights Law Center. It shows that the government is delaying passing a law that will significantly reduce smoking and in turn prevent cancer just because of the political donations from the tobacco industry. My dear audience, it is evident that these corporations are not only ready to shut down the interests of the citizens, but their interference are also putting their lives in danger. So it is only right that there is a law that comes this. My opponents may argue that regulation should instead be introduced to safeguard the interests of the citizens. But as student pharmacists, they know that the existence of a drug to cure an illness does not change the fact that prevention is more effective than cure. Moving on to Party B, the cooperation. In our world today, the support of one side automatically means opposing the other. The 2018 Elderman and Brand Study shows that 64% of consumers around the world will buy or boycott a brand solely because of its political position. The implication is that, for example, Shell Tech may likely lose two out of every three customers just because of a political statement. Judges, corporations are known to cater for consumers with different political views, and this puts them under a lot of pressure when forming political opinions. I mean, a corporation that cannot cooperate will fail to operate. So it is clear that if there is a law mandating that neutrality, it will save them from suffering a loss just because of a decision born out of pressure. 
it is common sense that corporations don't make political decisions for the state. But when they take a stance on political issues, it can sabotage their growth without effecting any change in public policy. My opponents may argue, and they know that the existence of a drug to cure a disease does not change the fact that prevention is more effective than cure. We can't keep back to see the government, according to a report by Elderman, a public relations company, 56% of people believe that brands lack authenticity in the stance they take on social political issues. And this is not so far-fetched. Corporations have been seen to publicly demand for racial equality while making donations to candidates that promote racial discrimination. As reported by the Center for Political Accountability in the year 2020, esteemed audience, expecting citizens to trust in a government heavily influenced by these same corporations, either by lobbying or use of political action committees to sway the lawmakers is comical. Even my opponent will agree that when there's a decreased level of trust in government, it leads to an increased breakdown of law and order. It is this simple logic that brought about the introduction of laws into the human society in the first place. Well, in a desperate bit to win today's argument, my opponent will say corporations should be given the free will either to be politically neutral or not. But as students who are they know that drug prescriptions and laws guiding the conduct of practitioners exist because humans cannot be trusted to do what is right by themselves. Because by nature, man is not guided by what is right to the society, but what is right to themselves. Our opponents may also try to group up the emotional sentiment by arguing that corporations staying politically neutral will undermine their freedom of expression. Even from a pharmacist, that argument has no form because according human rights are for individual persons and going by the definition of corporations in the Cambridge English Dictionary, it is a business that has a legally separate existence from the people who run it. Dangote is different from Dangote cement. So what Dangote can choose either to be politically neutral or not, Dangote cement should cement its cement business alone. In conclusion, everyone can now agree with the words of John Locke, an English philosopher, that the end of the law is not to abolish or restrain, but to protect and enlarge freedom. So, even though it's an argument for our opponents to swallow, they will agree that legally mandated corporations to stay politically neutral in their operations will protect party A, B, and C, and that's as simple as A, B, C. Gentlemen, welcome to the court of law. This is not a debate where I try to coerce or convince you to accept my stance. This institution is not to be the hub of knowledge and sound judgment where tests are bare faults. Therefore, I will simply roll out the dice and trust you to decide the winning number. I have been summoned to the Supreme Court to oppose this test. Should corporations be legally required to remain politically neutral in their operations? Ladies and gentlemen, my lord. In the next few minutes, I would like to present four pieces of evidence to support my stance. Evidence one, rights. 
according to Investopedia, a corporation is a legal entity which is separate and distinct from its owners. Under the law, corporations possess many of the same rights and responsibilities as individuals. They can enter into contracts, loan and borrow money, sue and be sued, and even pay taxes. The first mistake my opponents will make in today's debate is to have this definition of corporations that gives full evidence to the fact that corporations, just like you and I in UI, have rights and still argue that one of these rights be taken from them. Quite unjust, I must say. According to the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, adopted in 1971, corporations have the right to free speech. And in the case of Citizens United and the Federal Election Commission in 2010, the Supreme Court ruled that corporate spending or political campaign is a form of protected speech under the law. Therefore, corporations have the right to intervene in political matters. Evidence 1, presented. Evidence 2, legal requirements. According to Law Insider, Legal required means that a specified action is reasonably determined by a party to be necessary in order to satisfy or fulfill more or more of his requirements. No compulsory, but essential, else there will be consequences. Corporations which focus on long-term goals and not short-term profits will want to intervene in political matters that affect them or even members of staff. Also, politics plays a huge role in the success of businesses as political leaders make decisions such as labor laws and taxation laws that affect businesses. In 2020 elections conducted in the United States of America, AT&T, a company, made significant contributions to potential candidates from both major political parties. This is a common strategy by companies to build strategic relationships with policy makers. Ladies and gentlemen, our reason for legal requirements should be one that is required enough to do so. And if protection is the reason, as my opponents may say, I am sorry to say they may be backing at the wrong tree. Evidence 2 presented. Evidence 3 political neutrality. According to colleagues' dictionary, if a person or country remains neutral, they do not support anyone in a disagreement, war, or contest. It refers to a situation where the administration is not responsive and does not engage to some narrow party and political interests. According to an article published by Daniel Koshkon in the PPS News Hour, it states, it is more dangerous to remain silent than to take a political stand. Ladies and gentlemen, when companies take a stand, it affects their operations. Consumers build relationships with companies based not only on the quality of products and services, but also on how it supports itself. When corporations behave inconsistently by violating the expectation, it affects their consumers. We need to be hypocritical for a company that claims to be guided by a core set of values to reflect its stance. It means that they are trying to write something and want to receive their customer base. After all, according to the Nigerian Constitution, 1999 is a This is a criminal offense, liable for punishment under the law. This means, according to the law, a corporation can be sued. Making legal demands from corporations to be political neutral, simply because they are under the law, is like telling my friend to develop a drug to cure a disease, simply because he is from the sciences, social sciences. Simply impossible. Evidence 3 presented. Evidence 4 transparency and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, my opponents will come here and tell you that corporations have to withhold their stance, or you will tell you that corporations may fail at fall if they withhold their stance. But let me remind them, in 2017, Nike released an advertisement campaign featuring a celebrity who had publicly stood against racial inequality. Ladies and gentlemen, this affected, this caused a lot of backlash and support, but for this company, their profits did not do you. When corporations speak of political issues, it may resonate to some of their audience, and to some, it may resonate. But understanding the status of a political operation actually affects these companies. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very important for companies to state their stance when it comes to political issues. I must also encourage them to state the stance. Just like I've said, the First Amendment has approved this. Just like I've said, it is evident that a, this is not a legal requirement. Just like I've said, it does not mean that politicians ask for political neutral. Rather, they ask for neutral. My opponents from social sciences will come here today and talk to you. But let me remind them that when it comes to issues like this, they should not bother to talk. Ladies and gentlemen, corporations will come and tell you these things, and they will try to convince you. But let me remind you, even the Holy Book says, forgive them for you don't know what they are doing. Those who are supposed to be custodians of social values will come here and tell you that you don't need to disguise the social values. But then, like I said before, the Holy Book has told us, Forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. So my audience will come here and they will come here and talk and they will give you points. But please forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, 
in confusion, in confusion. They won't do this in Kosasua. No one should be a judge in their own case. Therefore, I am not a judge in my own case. The guys has been ruled. The winning number has been decided. And we all know who the winner is. I have clearly presented four pieces of evidence to show that cooperation should not be legal in card, to remain politically neutral in the operation. And to my dear opponents, let my name ring in your ears. Let my name stand in your heart. I am Olakulei Ademus. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faculty of Pharmacy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be moving to the second speaker from the Faculty of the Social Sciences. If your hands are not too busy, jump them together for Ella Stephen Favor. My opponent's stance in today's debate is indeed a hard pill to swallow, not only for them, but for the sanity of today's competition. But worry not, I am here to correct all their errors by administering effective dosages to all ailments their stance has caused us. Ailment 1, drug abuse. This is a term described by Britannica.com as the excessive and dysfunctional use of substances. For the sake of today's debate, I present to you politics, the substance, and corporations, the abuser. According to the New York Times, a clear case of this abuse occurred in 2010 when British consulting company Cambridge Analytica used the data of up to 87 million Facebook users to manipulate and sway voters in support of former U.S. President Donald Trump. Audience, what this indicates is whether it is self-administered or administered by my opponent after their induction, the absence of political neutrality leads to an abuse of the political system. This is why it has to be administered as a dosage to prevent this abuse and to leave us with a more healthy political system. Now, my opponent will argue that corporations' political participation signals a commitment to social impact and well-being. But the problem with this argument is even though it appears sound, that is all there is to it, mere sound. Political neutrality does not in any way prevent companies from exercising their corporate social responsibility. Rather, it forces them to stay away from trivialized attempts at social activism and to focus on their CSR endeavors. So dear student pharmacists, think like a pharmacist. Moving on, ailment two, corporation alienation. According to a Springer Nigeria article, during the 2011 to 2014 PDP government era, firms connected to that party experienced a 13.5 increase in value. However, as expected, firms connected to the opposition party experienced a 3.3% decrease in value. Audience, what this shows us is in the absence of the dosage of political neutrality, the economy of a corporation stops being about demand and supply, but about demand and support. Judges, it is common sense that if the fortunes of an economy of a country's economy becomes dependent on political trend, this would eliminate investors' confidence. Now, of course, my opponents will argue that corporations will still participate in politics because it is unavoidable whether or not polit political neutrality is legalized. Yes, we can agree with Aristotle that man is a political animal that cannot avoid politics, but let us not forget 
the context of today's debate, debate politics as it applies at the state level and not at the individual level, they are flawed argument. It's an attempt at adding none to something that already makes sense. In conclusion, we have administered all those ages to all elements and areas their stance has caused us. There is only one thing left to do. DS never assist. Don't overdose. <laughs>
CSR includes economic, social, and environmental duties that these corporations heavily invest themselves in. So mandating corporations to be politically neutral only means that these corporations will be forced to be silent even when negative policies are being implemented in the society. Now, in case my opponent thinks we are the only one opposing political neutrality, the 2019 Elderman Trust Barometer data revealed that 54% of employees globally want CEOs to speak up on social and political issues. Similarly, 53% of consumers believe corporations to be responsible when they speak up on at least one social issue that does not directly affect them. My dear opponents, all this data goes to show that corporations are required and heavily expected to be to speak up on social issues. So why are my opponents saying that this corporation be forced to be politically neutral? Even Joe Wall would not agree with them. And with that, fallacy three spotted. Ladies and gentlemen, we have finally come to the end of this game. And I have two words for the Faculty of Social Sciences. Game over. <laughs> Thank you, Pharmacy. So that was a very interesting round. We have that of Faculty of Arts versus Veterinary Medicine. We have Environmental Design versus Basic Medical Sciences. We have Public Health versus Dentistry. And we have the Social Sciences versus Pharmacy. Before we go into the next round, I would like to inform T Daddy to get himself prepared as he will soon be called on stage. T Daddy, I don't know whether you are under the sound of my voice. Get prepared. Draw 2024! Thank you very much. Jam your hands together for yourselves for being the most energetic audience ever. So I'll be calling on the representative of Insights Radio as they have a talk for us. Jam your hands together for the Abisola song. Alright, thank you, Mr. DJ. Joe War 2024. Thank you so much for that. Good evening, everyone. My name is Abisola Esso, and I am a representative of Insight Radio. I'm here to tell you about Insight Radio. And as you all know, we are the radio partner for Joe War. At Insight Radio, we dish out premium information, recent happenings around the globe, entertainment at the best peak. We have various shows that run 247. And of course, some of our programs are Health and Safety Program, Environment and You, Sheep Express, Home Show, and of course, the Drive Time Show, and many more. For the sake of Joe War, we have free advert placement for entrepreneurs. And our, initially, we have 10 slots, which we announced even before now. But then, some already got some slots, but we have few ones left. So in case you would like to get a free slot for advert placement for entrepreneurs, Please do well to send a WhatsApp message to 0901-782-7767. Again, in case you'd like to get a free slot for your advert placement for entrepreneurs, do well to send a message, a WhatsApp message to 0901-782-7767. And lastly, Still on Joe War 2024, you can predict and win for various categories for Joe War. 
All you have to do is follow us on Instagram at Inside Radio underscore. Click on the link in the bio to join the fans club. Then predict and win. Now, your prediction is for all the categories. On Tuesday, we add the one for alls. Today is for faculties. And definitely, you can do that, predict and win. But first, you have to follow us on Instagram at Inside Radio underscore. Click on the link in the bio and join the fans club. Then you can predict and win a big gift. Lastly, I'd like to say a very big thank you and shout out to everyone who has been listening to Inside Radio. I mean, they've been listening to Joe Raw on Inside Radio. Thank you so much for your beautiful reviews. Thank you so much for all you said. We saw everything on Twitter, we've been seeing things. On Instagram, we've been seeing your comments too. Thank you so much. Again, always listen to Inside Radio. We are the light you need. Many thanks. If I tell you, say I love you. My money, my body, my go up, baby. I see billion for the account to you. Versace and Gucci for your body, baby. Let's go. Where's the sound guy? Mm. Sing, 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 sing. Give me more time. Are you ready now? I said we're going to be giving out 2,000 naira. So we're giving out 2,000 naira cash to three people right now. Are you ready? But before we give out the 2,000 naira to three people, we have a necklace here for a female. We have a necklace here for a female. Silver necklace. We have a scrunch. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I hope I'm pro Is this scrunch? Scrunchy. Eh? Scrunchy. Scrunch now. Scrunchy. Scrunchies. It's like handband, Abby. Wait, wait. What is it for? Hey. So, scrunch, right? Scrunchy. Scrunchy. Uh -huh. So there is, those two are for females, courtesy of God's treasure accessories. She's outside, so you can get more scrunch. <laughs> you can get more scrunch outside. Wh what? Okay, so you can get more scrunchy outside. More necklaces, jewelries. She's outside, God's treasure. Now, how are we going to do the giveaway? That's the most important question. We also have Kilishi, courtesy of Horikos Kilishi, original, all the way from Kano. Obelego, Obelego, chicken money. Now, for the first giveaway, I'll start with the Kilishi. I need like the fastest person that we can answer. So how I'll do it is that I'll go to my Instagram and the first correct answer gets it. The question is, wait, now. the first correct answer gets it for the Kilishi. Are you ready? <laughs> If you are using glow, I want to win the way. I don't pity you. Your message might deliver during semi-finals. Okay. The first question. What? What is this call? What is this call? Everybody say go And the first question is... Wait, wait, take it down, we'll take it down. The first question is... Are you ready? The first question is... Uh, why is MTN doing like this, <laughs> The first question for the Kilishi goes thus. 
What is what is the current score for Nigeria versus Angola? Now, ladies and gentlemen, while I collect the answer with multi choice Nigeria and Deloitte, can we please make some noise as I welcome a special performance? Daddy, I'm a student of UI. I'm from Faculty of Education, anyways. Uh, <laughs> Alright, I just have one question for you guys. Uh, how many of you still believe in love? For real? Oh! Alright, <laughs> alright. So I just came here to, you know, uh, remind you guys that, you know, there's still love. So, in case you know the song, you can sing it along with me. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> So let's do this better.
second round of the debate and we are continuing in the same pace. We are continuing in the same pace. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Now we'll be going to the next debate for the evening and the next debate for the evening is going to be between the Faculty of Economics Wait, 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 D wait, 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 wait. Faculty of Economics, I have a question for you. How many departments are in your faculty? Calm down now. Wait, wait, wait. How many? One. All of you economics. Hey. How many departments in your faculty? Four. Versus the faculty of science. Take it down, take it down. They'll be talking on the topic, media freedom, pillar of democracy, or tool for political manipulation. The first speaker for this round is the speaker from the faculty of the very beautiful building, the Faculty of Economics. Make some noise for all the Aka of June 2021. My phone was blowing up with Twitter notifications. I gave it 10 minutes, then 5 minutes, then 2 minutes, and everything went quiet. Twitter had been banned. We had been silenced. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have been given 5 minutes, and I stand there refusing to be silenced until I'm heard. According to Oxford Learner's Dictionary, media is the main way by which people receive information and entertainment. And according to Merriam Webster's Dictionary, freedom is the absence of necessity, coercion, or constraint, a choice or action. Audience, merging these two definitions, media freedom is the absence of question in the media. And today's debate is to determine whether the media would be a pillar of democracy or a tool for political manipulation when it is free. Now, tweeting with four hashtags, I'll show you why media freedom is a pillar of democracy. One, 
Hashtag informed, not misinformed. Dangote, Elumelu, and Hush Puppy are seated in a gathering. Suddenly, two debit cards vanished. Whose card is the last card standing? Judges and audience. There is only one reason why most of our answers will be Hush Puppy. Media literacy. According to Oxford reference, media literacy is the consistency of various pieces of media and the ability to think critically about them. Media literacy helps citizens to make independent decisions, which is a cornerstone of democracy. Audience, when the media is left to operate freely, without government influence, it informs without bias. And this intersection between media freedom, literacy, and independent decision is essential for establishing an informed citizenry, which is essential for upholding our democracy. Oh, this tweet just went viral. Two, hashtag, two, hashtag participation, not auto, two, hashtag participation, not apathy. The, the American Economic Association's paper titled Media Freedom, Political Knowledge and Participation says that countries underscores that countries with underscores that countries with restricted media freedom underscores that countries with restricted media freedom exhibit poor political knowledge reduce political participation and low voter turnout this crucial insight informs us that when there is a lack of media freedom it empowers the public's decision to hold their politicians accountable and to scrutinize and to scrutinize these politicians conversely nations with freer media nations with freer media Witness increase in civic activities such as attending lawful demonstration, sustaining such as attending lawful demonstration, signing petitions, and joining unofficial strikes. And joining unofficial strikes. These activities together signify an active and informed citizenry, which once again says the pivotal role of media freedom as a tool for upholding our democracy. Audience, at this point, you might be tempted to say, can we just stop here? I wish it were the same, but our opponents are public, but our opponents are sore losers, so we must continue. Again, this tweet just went viral. Three, hashtag accountable, not autocratic, not autocratic, ladies and gentlemen. If we want to hold our government accountable, then the media must be free, because barring this, expressing the truth becomes challenging, as what is given can easily be taken back. A prime example of this is Nigeria. Let us recall ex-president Muhammadu Buhari's decision to ban Twitter in 2021. If my opponent thinks this restriction is too mild, let them turn their guests to North Korea, where the government strictly controls the media, and citizens face severe punishment, even death, for accessing ordinary foreign media. Ah, do you see the pattern? Autocrats sustain control by limiting, by limiting media freedom, by limiting media freedom, because they know that when the media is free, it will lead to knowledge, and this in return will lead to, and this in return, and this in return will lead to a cry for democracy. Again, this tweet just went viral. Four, hashtag interpretation, not truth. My opponents will come and claim that we have misunderstood their stance. They will say they do not want another North Korea, nor Eritrea. They will say that they want the media to be better regulated. However, they are the ones who have misinterpreted. Because according to a paper titled Media Regulations, titled by Oxford, titled by Oxford, titled by Oxford Bibliographies in 2017, titled by Oxford Bibliographies in 2017, these regulations are already put in place. Regulations like quotas and content restrictments are already there. Or do they want the government to perhaps supervise it? If this is a bright idea, please tell them that it is illogical for the government to supervise what they have in control. Finally, attentive audience, judges, opponents, I have shown you that it's only when the media is free from all forms of government control that then it will be able to uphold democracy. If my opponents come here to tweet with yet another hashtag, please tell them this tweet just violated the Twitter rules. Learn more. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Tell the world. Shut up, right? 
So please, when the speakers are speaking, try as much as you can to be silent. They really need it to remember their speeches. So I'll be calling on the first speaker from the Faculty of Science. Jam your hands together for Amadare Mercy. Ladies, gentlemen, in the next five minutes we'll be peeling an onion. And while this onion will not make us cry, I honestly can't say the same for my opponents. Media freedom, put the right kick to an onion. From the outside, this is often devoted as the bedrock of democracy. For fostering dialogue, shaping public opinions, and driving political discourse. But why stop at the surface? When you begin to build the layers, and once reality is revealed, go and wear media freedom. It's more of a tool for political manipulation than it is a pillar of democracy. Audience, grab your knives, because today we'll be peeling five different layers to reveal the true identity of media freedom. Layer one, basic understanding. Media, according to the Collins Dictionary, is a means of communication that can reach or influence large numbers of people. It is obvious to say that media in the sense goes past journalists and news stations, but also extends to social media and the influencers on them. Simply put, media freedom is not only limited to Abu, a trained reporter and journalist at NTA, but also extends to at Glass by Tata and Instagram Slepping, who has no background in journalism whatsoever. But in fact, the decision of a large audience daily through the social media. So, if our opponents should come up here today and place their argument on the traditional news stations and the likes, forgive them. You can be very close to the faculty of law and still not understand logic. Distinguished audience, social media is becoming mainstream. And even the premium times agrees, as of 24 of January 2023, it's reported that the social media is being actively utilized to gain advantage during elections. The African BBC also reported that political parties were paying social media influencers to spread this information in the run up to the previous election held in Nigeria. So you see, why we all were in our various homes, thinking our trusted influencer, the law or anti tatcha was providing us with real insight and honest truth. They most likely have been paid under the table to serve us by us the information. How then can my opponents come up here and claim that it is a pillar of democracy? Clearly, they have also been misinformed. Layer two, media ownership. Judges, let us take a look at the media itself. One of the core tenets of it being a pillar of democracy is to serve as a check and balance for government, institutions, and persons. And what makes this possible is the separation between the state and the media. But according to an article titled Who Owns the Media, published in the Journal of Law and Economics, which examined the pattern of media ownership in almost 100 countries across the world, it was discovered that government and government related ownership of the media is pervasive. And the data gathered suggested that such media were constantly distorting information to retain the incumbent politicians, preventing voters from making informed choices, and eventually undermining democracy. So you see, as long as government entities cannot be excluded from media ownership, media freedom will always remain a tool for political manipulation. Layer three, selfish interest. Distinguished audience, the media over time has been manipulated through selective storytelling to fit certain narratives. They are playing and at times ignoring important issues. According to a paper titled Media Manipulation, a dialogue in the literature and media, it was established that the United States and its allies reported the presence of mass weapons of destruction in Iraq, which led to the support of the country's invasion in 2003. Interesting to note now is the fact that not even one of these supposed weapons of mass destruction have been found to date. The paper went on and mentioned instances of parallel reporting of the same events during the war, where American media sources avoided close-up views of the bombings and its gruesome aftermath to protect the patriotic feelings of U.S. citizens. And Middle Eastern media sources 
hate the other side of the game to flan anti American sentiment. You see, in both cases, selfish interest played out. The media has grossly betrayed our trust in them and have offered themselves up as fools for political manipulation. Layer four. The media is not free. My opponents will come up here to claim that media freedom protects the media from government influence and intervention. However, the media may never be free from government intervention, as seen in the fallout of the Lekki Town Gate massacre, where various media outlets were issued penalties by the National Broadcasting Corporation for violating broadcasting guidelines. But we all understand what was at play. You see, the media's vulnerability to government influence is evident, and as a result, manipulation is inevitable. President Inubu at TVC, Donald Trump and Fox News, James who worry at the Daily Independent and so on are living proofs that the media has surrendered itself to political entries and media freedom is nothing more but a tool for political manipulation. Layer 5, the school of economics, distinguished audience. My opponent may come up here to say that media freedom allows various perspectives without censorship. However, if that is true, who then controls the prevalence of say paid news? Who censors one sided reporting? In a great contrast, because all these are very unchecked spread of propaganda. That is a height of manipulation. So you see, in the school of economics, numbers may add up. When today's debate, their point does add up. They may be experts at drawing court, but their cause today is the curve of the leadership reports. Where the more they elaborate, the less confusing it becomes. From the faculty of science, I am Omar Jago Messi. Thank you very much, thank you, thank you. Draw our audience, can we do this? Let's try and do this when we hear punchlines from our speakers. The noise will distract the judges. Thank you very much. So I'll be calling on the second speaker from the Faculty of Economics. Faculty of Economics. Jam your hands together for Olasukomi Joshua. And gentlemen, like oxygen, the most crucial element in the air we breathe, media freedom is the life force of any democratic society. The topic today can easily be understood with three problems every economy faces. What to produce? Democracy. Who to pro for whom to produce? The people. You, my audience. And now, the question of the day, how to produce? Intellectual audience. The answer to this is simple. Media. And the key to its efficiency, freedom. This is the bullshit. However, we we'll continue. Media freedom. Media freedom expresses the right to other right. Media freedom protects the right to other right. But exposing issues of corruption, discrimination, and abuse of power. This vital, this vital tool in the hands of the democracy helps us in shaping what we are truly are. According to the High Commissioner of the Human Rights Council, in the Council of Europe, stated that. Media freedom is a vital tool for the, for the protection of other human rights. So you see, media freedom is a tool that protects other human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, my opponent will come with false hypothesis, giving a logical prediction why um, media freedom is false. However, I will show you three basic reasons why media freedom is the key of democracy. My, argument, my opponent may argue that media freedom now, let me argue that, media free, that a free media can easily be manipulated by individuals and government. However, when, when the media is free, it is easy for the... However, when the media is free, the government cannot easily manipulate it because diverse source of information helps to prevent... helps to prevent manipulation. In essence, ladies and gentlemen, Media freedom thrives on a, on a pillar. The pillar is democracy.
Jesus. Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, calm down. Let's talk intellectual wisdom. If nature is free, how would it be a tool of political manipulation? Because you and I would be able to tweet things, exposing the truth to our every situation. My opponents have come here to make different brands, but in reality, this is democracy, and not a demo from a crazy scientist. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand the situation here, but I rest my case. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls together, people of love today. concluded round or this round we are currently having rather between economics and science i'd like to reiterate that when speakers are talking just give them the room now for the second speaker of economics he'll be retaking his speech and we'll be having total decorum are we all in alliance so please and please, let's give him total decorum. Now, mind you, please take it down. Mind you, standing here on this stage is no child's play. To stand and talk to hundreds of students is no child's play. Please, I implore you, let's give him the room. So now, I will call on the second speaker from the Faculty of Economics. Put your hands together. And gentlemen, like oxygen, the most crucial component of the earth, media freedom is the life force of a democratic society. The topic we face today can be easily understood with three basic questions. Every economy produces one for whom to produce the people, you, my audience, and now the question of the day how to produce intelligent audience. The answer to this is simple media, and the key to its efficient utilization is freedom. No calculations there, two simple truths. Let me teach you. Media freedom protects the right to, of expression, in which turn, protect all of that rights by exposing issues like torture, discrimination, corruption, and misuse of power. 
although democracy comprises government arms and enforcement bodies, it is the freedom of the media that brings life into the entire system. The Commissioner of Human Rights in the Council of Europe emphasized his better role when she stated, freedom of the media is essential for protecting all human rights. This spreading of facts is the first crucial step in addressing human rights problems. So you see, media freedom not only sheds light on the truth, but also from the backbone of people's rights. And that is the essence of democracy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my opponent will bring first hypothesis, stating illogical protection to derail us. But this is democracy and not a demo for a mad scientist. And I we shall prove today that democracy is not some mixing of chemicals, but a reality. Hypothesis one. My opponent argued that a free media can easily be manipulated by individuals and governments. This they may explain using government attempts during the NSAS protests to manipulate media opinion. But during our experiment, question we had, data was analyzed, and we found that due to multiple information sources of media, discrepancies were exposed. Media freedom allowed diverse narrative, good and bad, granting citizens the role of truth bearers. In essence, Democracy tried in a multiplicity of information, allowing citizens to navigate and decide the truth independently. Our reference, hypothesis rejected, hypothesis two. They may say again that media organization went free. When free with significant agenda setting power by influence, what issues and again prominence and shaping the discussion. But again, during the experiment, questions were had and data was analyzed. We found that when media is free, private ownership of media outlets prevents concentration of agenda setting power, ensuring a multiplicity of perspectives, thereby opposing democracy. Our inference, again, hypothesis rejected. When my opponents, my in conclusion, judges, when my opponents claim that media is not a true, is not truly free, so it is not a pillar of democracy, please tell them that this is not the topic we are dealing with today. And this is a gross manipulation of the topic. Rejected, rejected, rejected. My scientists go to the lab and try again. But still, your observation will be rejected. Thank you very much. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Tell the world. together for the second speaker from the Faculty of Economics. The next speaker we'll be having is the second speaker from the Faculty of Science. Make some noise for Anieti. Bless you. Clearly, they understand demand and supply. Today, they have demanded more lessons, and I am here to supply them. I have only one assignment in the next three minutes to build three strongholds. We shall demolish every pillar my opponent has come here to uphold. Stronghold one, Afghanistanism. Afghanistanism, according to my Webster dictionary, is concentrating on global issues while ignoring vital local concern. Simply put, the government uses international event and conflict to divert attention from internal matters. Audience, the media has a standing reputation for promoting Afghanistanism. Notably, in 1988, China media prioritized South, dis South China disputes, rarely public support, and shifting attention from economic challenges and human rights concern. It and human rights concern. to focus, shape public perception to align with political agenda, allowing the government control the narrative, downplay domestic controversies, and shift attention from issues that might challenge their authority. Strong O2, intelligent audience. My opponents argue that media freedom promotes transparency and accountability, which is a pillar of democracy. However, let me school my opponents from the School of Economics using principle of behavioral economics as like in taking fast and slow, a book by Daniel Kahneman. The concept of information overload mentioned in this book is difficulty to possess vast amount of information leading to decision paralysis. 
in 2016 U.S. election, an article published by Center for Information Technology, Technology and Society Review that a bucket of information was released about the candidate, their policies and their scandals, resulting to people relying on biased sources and confirmation biased. Therefore, accountability was compromised. Strong all three, my opponents may even argue that media freedom guarantees people participation in election, which is a form of which is a pillar of democracy. Please forgive them. They are from the school of economics. What can they know about politics? According to a paper, that is social media effect, hijacking democracy and civility in civil engagement review. That social media gives people the platform to voice their opinion about it. The election without necessarily participating in the democratic process. I mean, we all know of keypad warriors who fought tirelessly for OP on Twitter, but we know where to be found at the polling unit. This can serve as a tool for political manipulation, as the experts could be fooled into thinking that they could win the election based on social media reaction, only to see empty polling unit on the election day. In conclusion, ladies, gentlemen, you see, if today's debate was based on the beauty of buildings. The school of economics would have won. Sadly, today's debate focuses on what is in the building rather than how fine the building is. The school of economics has come to tell us about the beauty of buildings, but the faculty of science has effectively analyzed what is in the building. This message is not about buildings. From the faculty of science, I remain a Nieti. Bless you. <laughs> Now we have the next round between Faculty of Law. How was that? Are you ready? And the Faculty of Renewable Natural Resources. Wait, 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 wait. Let's do that again. Let's do that again. Between the Faculty of Law. They'll be speaking on the topic, is counterbalancing effective in preventing coup? Is counterbalancing effective in presenting coup? And the first speaker would be from the faculty of law. If your hands are not too busy, put them together for one of your own, the one, the only, Ugojuku Let's go! Attention civilians, according to an anonymous report we see earlier today, a coup has been plotted against the faculty of law and is about to be staged. Unfortunately, these coup plotters are the inexperienced cadets from the faculty of RNR whose first experience at Joe War was just three years ago. But not to worry, because I, Major General Chineke Ugochuku, have come to declare five clean sweep operations. So cadets, brace yourself for command, because when I call, you respond, sir, yes sir. First, Operation Urgent Clarity. The College Dictionary defines counterbalancing as distributing powers across different institutions of government, creating a system of checks and balances. Ladies and gentlemen, to paint a clearer picture, when the government divides the state military power into the, into the army, navy, FBI, CIA, that is counterbalancing. 
When the government divides the state political power into the legislative, executive, and judiciary, that is counterbalancing. So you see, there are two major types of coups to be discussed in today's debate, military coup and civilian coup. So if my opponents focus on just military coups, they have lost today's debate even before it started. So opponent, brace yourself for wisdom, because when I call, you respond, sir, yes sir. Declaring operation mind games, ladies and gentlemen, the effectiveness of counterbalancing can be seen in how it works on the mind of the military, that they no longer possess the monopoly of force, and so cannot effect changes as they like. For instance, in August 1991, a group of soldiers plotted a coup in the Soviet Union and failed. Analysis in the book Politics and the Russian Army revealed that the major reason for the failure of this coup was because a lot of soldiers refused to join the coup because of the presence of the armed forces of the Supreme Leader. Ladies and gentlemen, these coup plotters had recruitment issues, and so the coup failed. You see, they tell us that what the mind conceives it achieves, but what they have failed to tell us is what happens to the mind when it's crippled by fear. It is bound to fail, and that is exactly what counterbalancing does. It introduces fear in the mind of coup plotters, and when a coup plot is carried out with fear, it is bound to fail. Besides, even if these coup plotters decide to listen to motivational speakers, live above their fear, and continue with the coup, the effectiveness of counterbalancing can also be seen in how it stops coordination and communication efforts. How? The presence of a hawk eye counterweight monitoring every move makes the entire coup process slower. The element of surprise is taken away, and the secrecy of information is compromised, making coup attempt unsuccessful. Ladies and gentlemen, this is commonsensical, but maybe, just maybe with my opponent, common sense is not that common. So opponent, brace yourself for higher logic, because when I call, you respond, sir, yes sir. Next, Operation Men in Black. Here we look at civilian coups. The effectiveness of counterbalancing is further heightened when we consider the fact that the division of power into the legislative, executive, and judiciary have been instrumental in preventing any single arm of government from gaining excessive control. Ladies and gentlemen, from gaining excessive control. Ladies and gentlemen, from, from gaining excessive control. Have been, have been instrumental in preventing any single arm of government from gaining excessive control. I've been instrumental in preventing any single arm of government from gaining excessive control. So you see, when counterbalancing is applied, ladies and gentlemen, everything falls in place. So opponent, brace yourself for higher logic, because when I call, you respond, sir, yes sir. Now, operation last man standing. Dear audience, beware, when my opponent come here to say that counterbalancing is not effective, because some countries that adopted it still experience schools. If only my opponents come to make that argument, please tell them that that update is not up to date. How? In the article titled Effectiveness and Counterbalancing, effectiveness is a measure of the success in achieving a clearly stated objective. Keyword, measure. That means effectiveness doesn't need to be 100%, but can be quantified by the degree of how it achieves its purpose. Now, in a case study of 16 coups by Erika De Bruyne, where counterbalancing was applied, 12, 12 coups were prevented, and only 4 were successful. That is a 75% success rate. I mean, even as UI students who did not score 700 in GS exam, would you say that 75% is not effective in giving you an A? Of course not. So with counterbalancing, success may not be 100% guaranteed, but effectiveness is 100% assured. Ladies and gentlemen, as we conclude, I've taken my opponents through five successful military operations. Now they are wiser, but even if in the next five minutes they march left or right, Please stand at ease because we have all their points phrased. Now for the final command. Opponent, stand at attention and salute the supremacy of the faculty of law because when we call, you respond. of Renewable Natural Resources.
Gentlemen, my opponents have claimed that counterbalancing is effective in preventing coups, but I'm here to examine this claim by defining three, three key words in our topic today counterbalancing, prevention, and effective. First, counterbalancing. According to Eric Adibui, an associate professor at Hamilton College, also regarded as the mother of the concept of counterbalancing. Counterbalancing is a strategy that has placed the state's coercive power into multiple overlapping forces, and it does this by the creation of non-military counterweights. But here is the catch. Gene Sharp, in his book titled The Anti-Coup, noted that coups are a result of different systemic faults working together. So it could be because of political apathy. It could be because of poverty. It could even be because of powerful individuals who lost for more power. For instance, the main reason behind the coup in Iran was due to foreign influence. In Egypt, it was instability, and in Burkina Faso, it, it was economic hardship. This implies that there is a diversity of causes, Many coups come in different forms and flavors, and counterbalancing is only capable of addressing the loss for power, which is just one cause out of many others. In essence, counterbalancing is like trying to use one stone to hit a hundred beds, and if the COVID era taught us anything, it is that one drug cannot prevent multiple variants of a disease. Moving on to the next keyword, prevention. The Oxford Language Dictionary defines prevention as the action of stopping something from happening in the future. So we can imply that for counterbalancing to be effective in preventing coups, it must first be able to stop the attempts from happening in the first place. At this juncture, there are two things we must all understand. One, according to Jonathan Powell, in the Journal for Peace Research in March 2011, a coup is an illegal attempt, usually by the military, to overthrow the sitting government. So contrary to what my opponent might try to make you believe today, a coup is a coup, not because it's a success, but because there is an attempt. And second, an attempt of a coup is just as dangerous as the success of one, because the attempt in and of itself challenges the legitimacy of the government, and at the same time, it can tempt others to attempt coup in future. So when you want to prevent coup, your problem isn't just about the success of the coup, but also the attempt. And my problem with counterbalancing is that it does nothing to deter this attempt. In fact, what it only does is try to counter the problem after it has already begun. To support this, Eric Adibui, after studying coups from over a hundred countries since 1960, came to the conclusion that counterbalancing does nothing to obstruct pre-coup coordination, neither does it deter coup attempt. In fact, the creation of a new force to counter coups increases the chances of a coup attempt in the following years. So it is simple. Counterbalancing is not a preventive measure, maybe a cure. And except to my opponents today, we all agree that prevention is better than cure. Moving on to the next keyword, effective. The Cambridge Dictionary defines effective as success in achieving the desired results. However, in the same analysis by Eric Adibui, counterbalancing increases the risk that coups escalate into civil wars. So it's not surprising that Jun Sudit, a professor of political science, noted that leaders facing an actual coup attempt are less likely to counterbalance. So, ladies and gentlemen, this caution is definitely not out of the goodness of their hearts. Rather, it is out of a genuine concern that counterbalancing could lead to something worse, a civil war. And from our definition of effective, this is not the result that we want. I mean, it is common sense that you cannot say paracetamol is effective for headache if it increases your risk of cancer. And the fact that my opponents are arguing otherwise makes me wonder if common sense is really common. Now, my opponent might try to remove the blame from counterbalancing by arguing that counterbalancing is effective when it is applied on time. So they might sound logical on paper, but this is not how it works in reality. Because you see, time and history have shown that there is no proper way to counterbalance. I mean, our Sadat of Egypt counterbalanced after four years he took over power, and yet he was still overthrown. 
Mohamed Morsi from the same Egypt. Counterbalance immediately over, he took power in 2012 and he was overthrown in the following year. So you see, this proves that there is no, there is no, this proof that there is no proper way or even a proper time to counterbalance. You see, in essence, counterbalancing is just like the faculty of law. People claim to be the home of public speaking because they can talk that talk on paper, but in reality, they don't work the work. Now, at this point, the deed is gone. Henceforth, in this trouble, I don't want to hear law is supreme this, law is supreme that, because based on the argument that these Storm Storm ambassadors have brought today, if there were to be a noodles, they might be Dangote Nudu, or maybe even Mini Me. Ha! Huh. They might be cheeky, but they can never be supreme. Insight Radio.